If the consensus says this is a terrible company, mm -hmm. and you think, oh, that's an opportunity, what you're doing there is you're combining the clear knowledge of the collective narrative, which is this is a bad company, with I also have a secondary understanding. <laughs>
because there's so much negative mm -hmm. press in and around it. So that That's gave right. you an edge. Um, so I just wonder, like, how much does human emotion play into what you call a narrative? Decision-making research has found that emotions, uh, the emotional circuits of our brain, underlie all of our decision-making circuitry. So mm. uh, we first must have emotions in place in order to make a decision. So people who don't process emotions like others make very poor decisions, actually. You sound um, like it, we're, we as humans are unable to be completely objective. That, I'm, that's, that's where I'm going. Um, right, yeah. I am a psychiatrist <clears throat> by training, though, and mm -hmm. most people in the financial markets might disagree with me, but that is what we see in neuroscientific research. So I, I originally used to do neuroimaging research, and we would look at how people decided between safe and risky investments. Mm. And so originally we saw that those choices, whether they are going for the safe or the risky, it all comes down to emotional circuits, mm. our, our reward pursuit circuits in the brain or our loss avoidance circuits. And only after a general impression has been made emotionally do we then craft later an explanation for why we did it. So the storytelling part of the brain is more evolutionarily yeah. evolved. It's the frontal cortex. Um, but it's the deeper circuitry of the brain in the limbic system that actually determines whether we buy or sell. Uh, we later created a craft a story. And you'll hear this um, in the markets after a hedge fund manager loses a lot of money and then says, well, you know, makes up an excuse. I didn't know, understand that or th this didn't make any sense. Well, is, is, it, is it an excuse or is he trying to justify to people? Well, it's a what? justification. Right, okay. a rational, <clears throat> a rationalization, right? Right, yeah, right, right. So we're rationally explaining what we did that was a mistake emotionally. And yet you and I are speaking now that emotional centers of our brain are communicating. Yeah. Um, but it's the emotional parts of our brain that really dominate most of our behavior. But w collectively, we can't just communicate with you know, anger or love or whatever it is. We have to communicate rationally. I remember a bit of advice I was given when I, when it was investing, yeah. which is maybe sounds impossible now, given what you just said, was like, don't love a stock, it doesn't love you back. Right. You know, don't fall in love with an idea. Right. And there's definite um, <clears throat> confirmation bias, and maybe this is a good time to talk about biases, because mm -hmm. once you, um, you do a sort of moderate amount of research into something and then you take a position, you, are, you automatically have a bias towards it, and then you just kind of start reading research or speaking to other people who have similar views to you. That's what right. what mm -hmm. advice do you try and give to investors to stop themselves from doing that? Well, there's... As you pointed out, there's many different types of biases. So there, there are cognitive biases, which are biases of how we think about mm -hmm. the world. So in that explanatory phase, we're um, not thinking as clearly as we should, or we have some bias. So for example, um, <coughs> and, and there's other biases I should explain as well, like emotional biases, like mm -hmm. overconfidence, for example. Um, what no, you're no, describing no, is... Now those biases, are, are some of them just purely innate? So there's just like, it's who we are as a character. Some of them are, mm. and some of them are situational. So it's what's happening over time, and that's where we go back to narratives. Right. So if somebody comes up and says, um, you know, if you believe that a stock is uh, underpriced relative to consensus, or, or the consensus says this is a terrible company, mm -hmm. and you think, oh, that's an opportunity, what you're doing there is you're combining, okay, the clear knowledge of the collective narrative, which is this is a bad company, with I also have a secondary understanding, which is rationally, when it's people, everybody else thinks this is a bad, when the, the story, the narrative is that this is a bad stock, then if they have an earnings win, they're going to go up twice as much as if they had an earnings miss. Mm. So you know that there's a, a cost-benefit advantage <clears throat> to going against the prevailing narrative. And most great traders know that, and they tell stories to themselves to remind themselves not to fall into the, the trap. And, Importantly, uh, retail investors often don't have that second order thinking. Mm -hmm. So in game theory, you, would, you have multiple layers of thinking. You have the people who just act and react to events, uh, which are generally retail investors, level zero, say. And then level one is thinking about, well, what are they doing? I don't want to fall into their traps. Mm -hmm. And then level two would be to think about what the people thinking about the <laughs> level zero are thinking. Oh my gosh. So you have these multiple layers of thinking in markets as well. And, and so what you were describing is a, is a higher order level of thinking about what, watching what others are doing, understanding their stories, and then knowing based on an event timing when their narrative is likely to shift from, oh, this is a bad stock to, oh, maybe it's not so bad, which will put a big risk premium back into that stock price. So if I can maybe give you an example, and you, you can sort of tell sure. me a little bit about how this fits into your, um, uh, into your work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, take Tesla, for example. 
So I think there was a, a lot of people out there who sort of fundamentally felt it was overpriced as inverted commas, a kind of car company, but mm -hmm. it's so much more than that. It's a sort of tech company. Right. But this is one of the questions, this is one of the things that's yeah. famously said in markets is, you, you know, the market can be wrong longer than you can stay solvent. Right. So mm -hmm. how do you, uh, you know, if, if you do think that, you know, a year or two ago, Tesla was uh, well overpriced and you were short the stock, for example, mm -hmm. how do you know when that narrative is, is changing? Is there, a, is there a way that it's actually measurable and thinking, huh, I can see sentiment is now changing, which is going to be the, the sort of, you know, uh, the, the point to which it breaks. Right, and you probably remember as a fund manager uh, the idea of catalysts. Mm -hmm. So you'd often look forward to some event or some uh, moment when other people would realize the value in this stock that wasn't there. Or in the case of Tesla, if you're arguing that it's overvalued, then what could there be that would reveal that this is actually a hot air, if that's what you believe about it? Sure. So um, I think you know the bulls and the bears each have their own story. Um, the bears of Tesla would say, well, if they eventually miss production by a certain amount, um, the bulls would say, that's going to be our catalyst to the downside. But mm. the bears have their own confirmation bias and their own uh, self-justifications about this. Mm. So if they miss production, they'll say, oh, it was because of lockdowns in China or mm. it was because of um, you know, the government thwarting Elon Musk's plans to build factories fast enough or it's a mineral shortage. Whatever it is, they'll have a rationale for that and say, just stay the course because it'll come back. Mm -hmm. So often the bias comes in when people become married to their story mm -hmm. or fall in love with the story that supports their belief in the stock. Mm -hmm. So there's, that, that's one type of bias. Of course, there's many other types. And there are, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, you'll find uh, more than 50 you know, pages with more than 50 different biases listed. And again, they do break down into the cognitive thinking biases and then these more emotional biases around that generally participate with narratives uh, around you know, loving a stock, confirmation bias, sunk cost bias, where you've invested a lot into something and so then you become a believer of it, mm -hmm. sort of like a cult following. Yeah. You know, you believe in the guru. Uh, you've already given all your material wealth to the guru, so it doesn't matter what he or she does now. Uh, you've got to follow them to the end. What are the sort of most common biases you see, you know, that, that uh, investors or, um, uh, you know, portfolio managers have and should try to avoid if they can? So it's a great question. There's the retail investor biases, which are very different than short-term trader biases and are very different from long-term investor biases. Um, for professionals. But so I'll, I'll talk about the professionals since that's mm -hmm. the most relevant audience, I think. So for professionals, the, there's research on, onto portfolio dynamics. So buying and selling behavior, um, they've looked at how does that correlate with returns over time? And there's, there's some behaviors that correlate with underperformance. Uh, so for example, there's portfolio manager behaviors, and these are called biases because they, they're known to create mm -hmm. underperformance over time. So. Um, Position sizing is known to be one of the biggest biases. And it's not, so th this is a behavioral bias. It's not necessarily a cognitive bias. We don't know why, but most portfolio managers don't put enough money into their highest conviction trades. They also tend to have- Sorry, most portfolio managers don't put-, put Enough money into uh, the high oh, conviction see. trades. Right. So if you have high confidence <coughs> in a thesis or an idea or a narrative, <laughs> yep. um, if you, you, they tend not to put enough money into the ones that they're really confident about and they keep uh, a farm or a playground of little ideas in yeah. the portfolio that they just want to watch. Yeah. Those, that playground underperforms a lot over time um, just based on the position sizing. And the high conviction trades or the larger size ones actually do outperform and they really should be putting even more, concentrating more into that. So that's one of the, the biggest biases that are known. A another one that's interesting is that portfolio managers tend to have good timing on the buy side. Mm -hmm. So they, they tend to make about 80 basis points over the first uh, six months of their holding of a position relative to their benchmark. But it tends to roll over. And on average, most of them tend to sell when it's actually at a bit of a loss relative mm -hmm. to their benchmark. And so they have great buy timing, but they have poor sell timing. So most of, another behavioral bias is most managers spend too much time on the buy decision and not enough time trying to understand when to sell. Right. So they, they end up having, a, I think it's about an 80 basis point uh, loss on many, on average, on losing trades because they, <coughs> after their the position ripens and starts to underperform, yeah. about, which is about two thirds through their average holding period, they end up uh, selling in response to news, like headlines, or price movement, 
which are not often relevant to their thesis. Mm -hmm. So they might have had a nice, well-crafted thesis about this business, but then Elon Musk tweets something random or mm -hmm. uh, some strange event happens that really has nothing to do with their fundamental thesis, and they'll react to it. Is there another, uh, um, this was one we used to talk about, that human, uh, human condition naturally um, uh, puts more of a value on not losing than they do on winning. So right. it is more enjoyable to, uh, sorry, it's more enjoyable to not lose 10 than it is to win 10, if you see what I mean. Yeah, that's right. So there's a natural sort of risk averseness baked within that. That's true, and so that's more of a retail investor bias. Okay. So with professionals, you see that that's often been ironed out because it's hard to be a professional, and every professional knows that. Mm. Right? So th there is this issue. Um, where it's holding losers too long mm -hmm. is the general behavioral right. effect you see yeah. because you, they don't want to accept. And so you'll see that with retail investors who ride a stock, to, you know, uh, electric car, the Rivian down to you know, very low values. Yeah. They buy in high. Uh, they because just can't it feels bear to good. sell it. They can't bear to sell it. Yeah. And even though it starts, you know, goes down 10%, 20%. And again, I, I was saying you shouldn't react to price movement, but in some cases, the thesis, the reason it's going down is it's not bearing out the thesis and mm -hmm. the valuation doesn't make any sense. So they don't, they simply don't check in. They say, well, I'm not going to pay attention. Mm -hmm. So head under the, you know, head in the sand mm -hmm. technique, which is part of this. Uh, holding losers too long. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when it comes time to harvest capital or you will have a new position you want, many retail investors will sell the winners because they say, well, this is doing well. I've got cash here. It makes me feel good to sell that and take the profit and, and own that I'm a great investor. I just hope that their yeah. losers you know, have some sort of rally. But Yeah, and, and then on the message <clears throat> boards and things, you know, express all the confidence in the world, you know, diamond hands, we're holding this forever. You know, I'm a long-termer. But the reality is, you know, Every short, every short term investor becomes a long term investor when they're underwater. That's, that's, true. that's the same. So. I mean, it seems like from what you're saying that it's obviously hugely beneficial if a company can create some, for lack of a better word, sort of sexy narrative around it. So, is that something that you see quite often? Is that when a company is able to create a good story around it, it becomes more overvalued? Or? Yeah, I mean, that's the goal of marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Is to find sometimes what they are looking for, what are the predominant narratives in the market, like crypto or blockchain. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see a company suddenly move into the blockchain space. Um, maybe <coughs> MicroStrategy legitimately, um, but other companies that simply add blockchain to their perspective. Well, I, there was this, tr there was this yeah. trend a few years ago about putting you know, anything to do with cryptocurrencies or blockchain exactly. in your title and it added value straight away to a share price. AI is another one mm -hmm. um, for a while. Yeah, there's, there's a variety, AI. Um, uh, metaverse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. know, there's, there's a lot of different uh, narratives that are really dominant in the market. and that, But literally, uh, people are also searching for those keywords. Mm. So they say, what companies are affiliated with this? And so a, a company that wants to get attention um, will put that in and their valuation will go up mm -hmm. because they're being found by analysts and by investors who are looking for that. Mm -hmm. So there, there's also a lot of companies riding on the coattails of a narrative. If I can ask you, what, what has, has been the effect of social media over the past five to 10 years in terms of <clears throat> either polarizing people or adding to biases? Uh, it's a great question. And the research is obviously mostly about politics. Um, so and the, the political research is uh, contentious. So uh, there's generally a, a thought that it does um, create some biases, but it actually may reduce polarization beyond what is already being created in, say, the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So, um, peop, for example, in Facebook, they find that Facebook news feeds actually provide, when they are, use the bias or these algorithms, you know, uh, they actually find that the algorithms produce more high level uh, or more quality counterfactual information for people than they would get if they didn't look for it. So, in, in, you know, Facebook's argument is actually the research shows that we present this information. If they don't read it, that's their problem, but we're actually presenting more of it. Mm. So, the, so then the question is why do people not choose to read it or not choose to believe it? And what seems to happen is when people see a narrative that's against their own beliefs. So we have the bulls and the bears of Tesla. When the bulls of Tesla see some, a bear say, well, you know, the value of Tesla requires 50% average annual growth for the next 10 years, which no company in history has ever done. Mm. They say, Tesla will do it. Elon yeah. Musk can do it. Yeah. And they, they have a confirmation bias or an ability to only see the information that they want to see. And then on message boards and social media, you'll see them say, and I'm blocking you. You're a flamer. I'm blocking you because yeah. that person's actually speaking rationally about some other narrative and they don't want to hear that other narrative. Mm.
Yeah, I kind of thought you were going to say the opposite in the sense that um, some of these social media platforms and um, uh, forums can actually try and create sort of herd mentality faster than before. So, you know, whether it's yeah. the, the GameStops or the AMCs or, you know, these, these forums that can, that can gather people faster than ever before. Because sort of pre-social media, it would be hard for retail investors, retail investors to sort of gather enough critical mass to have an effect. It's interesting you bring that up because we've had message boards in social media since the 90s. In the late 90s, I was quite active and it's where I got the idea for my own data business was I was looking at social media and message boards and seeing different ideas pop up and realizing, for example, in the late 90s, it was internet, of course, but it was also things like China joining the WTO. So if you had a Chinese internet company, wow, that was a hot story. That right, was a good narrative. So because it's the biggest market in the world and the biggest new thing in the world was the internet. So there were these themes and narratives that you, you could find. And I had to do it manually because there's no software to help me sort through all the narratives mm -hmm. and finding where is this popping up? Where are people paying attention to this narrative about this company? And just like in crypto, some of those companies would pop you know, 10, 10 times when that narrative became associated with the company. So it was always a question of finding the narrative and where is it? If people want to see when the... Uh when the narrative is changing on a particular stock or mm -hmm. on a particular commodity, are there uh, vehicles that you can use to try and you know, go onto the internet and just whatever, type in what buzzwords and, and see what comes back and you, then you start to see, oh, I'm starting to see the reforms talking negatively about whatever it is, about some uh, Amazon or whatever it is, but mm -hmm. is, are there ways of doing that? Like trying to get market sentiment from internet forums? There, there are. I mean, I, so our own company does that as well. Mm -hmm. We also have a, a platform where we monitor what's happening in all of news and social media. So there's definitely uh, platforms like that. Um, we're unique in that we're looking at the emotions as well and the common themes that are driving the stories. Mm -hmm. So trying to search through and find, you know, what are the latest autonomous vehicle stocks or something like that is something you can do. And does it work mm -hmm. in the world of, of crypto as well? I'm actually yeah, thinking, thinking to, um, yeah. you know, what recently happened with Terra and Luna. And like, would that have been a, would that, could you have, spotted that sort of de-pegging happen given the kind of commentary that was going on in the internet and forums? So with Terra and other cryptocurrencies, you do see changes in sentiment that are um, evident before events happen. And mm -hmm. so you can actually see this systematically. But with Terra, yeah. So on a cherry-picked basis, yeah, we saw sentiment dropping about Terra um, even before the last peak where it hit over $100 uh, per coin. We saw that sentiment was dropping pretty substantially in social media. So uh, can yeah. you explain that in a little bit more detail? When you say oh, sure. we could see that sentiment was uh, dropping, uh, is okay. it, do, do you mean like there were certain words being said or is uh, it yeah. the number of people were... Anyway, you explain. We have a software company, myself and my partners have a software company where we monitor all of the news and social media in thousands of forums and message boards, etc. that's being discussed about cryptocurrencies, stocks, 100,000 stocks, um, ETFs, etc. And we're looking at what are the words associated with that, those expressions and what are the themes? Like, are people positive about them? Are they negative about them? Which is sentiment. That's the most basic. But we're also looking at emotions. How are people discussing this? Are they talking about it with anger? With, are they afraid of something? Are they, uh, what themes are they using? Like adoption with cryptocurrencies is known to drive uh, prices. Or what's their sentiment about the code? or what's their sentiment about the development team at the company. So you mm -hmm. can look at very specific types of sentiments or its emotions or, or unique themes like adoption mm -hmm. using software like this. So by monitoring thousands of message boards and forums and news outlets, minute by minute, we can see sort of the emotional and psychological vital signs of the markets. What are people talking about? What are they feeling about each asset? And then by um, adding machine learning to that with predictive models, you can then pull out okay, these themes tend to be predictive in the crypto market. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned code, right. code sentiment, for example. Yeah. Innovation uh, yeah. by a team, the more innovation there is, tends to be predictive. So, and just broadly, social media sentiment is predictive. Yeah. And so we've, we see, for example, every month, if you just aggregate the sentiment of different coins, let's say the top 10 in the crypto market, um, and then rank them by that sentiment, the top two will substantially outperform. And so we have this data since... Do you want to just tell us what they are now and give us some oh, hot, yeah. hot tips? <laughs> <laughs> it's month to month, so I'm afraid that by the time this comes out, it'll be over. <laughs> yeah. okay, right, well. But, but yeah, those, those patterns are real. And um, with Terra, we saw it was, the sentiment was diving. So that, was, that would put it in the lower tier mm -hmm. rather than the ones that you should buy because they're more positive. It was down in the more negative tier. Um, well, this sounds like a very important era of investing that everyone should be investigating because um, do you feel that the, the narrative of um, or sentiment is becoming a bigger, a bigger part of how certain assets play out? 
Well, I think with, co <coughs> with COVID, people are more attentive to the need for up-to-date information. So when COVID hit, people, mm. many analysts, when I say people, I mean uh, security analysts, said, wow, well, all of our fundamental models, how do they make any sense now? Because all of our valuation, now we need to know something else. We need to know what sector is this? Is it healthcare and biotech? Mm. Do they make ICU beds? Do they make masks? Um, you know, hospital supplies? What, what, is, what do these companies do specifically that will benefit from COVID? And they, every, the whole research industry had to change how they thought about it. And then, oh wait, there's vaccines coming. What does that mean for travel and leisure? Are they, you know, will cruise ships come back? Will, the, will Carnival make it through? Mm. Uh, will hotel companies make it through? Now, how do we reposition ourselves? So there were, there's multiple waves. And so what we've seen recently is just more impactful narratives hitting the market faster. Mm. Uh, so and then, I think, yeah, yeah. There's, there's also the, the ability to access data now. I mean, you can literally go onto websites and to see how many people are clicking on holiday booking sites at any right. given moment of the day. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, there's never been such real time information out there. And that's true. And then you also have to think, OK, we've had, but as an analyst, you have to think ahead to not just what's happening right now with holiday bookings, but OK, and um, P Omicron wave comes or the BA2 wave comes up. Uh, people are, are clicking less. But every wave in the past, they start clicking again, mm. you know, a month later. How long? Now you have to know the viral incubation times, the viral spread periods, and then what, how long does it take until you have herd immunity in a given region? So you have to really think about yeah. viral you know, epidemiology. And you also have to understand now inflation and interest rates. Oh, and war. What's Vladimir Putin thinking mm. long term? <laughs> so you have a lot of psychological guessing to do. Right. But all of these boil down into narratives because to make those guesses, you have to be reading the media extrapolating from those stories that they're telling you into like, well, what's the truth here? Well, this is what's happening now, but what's likely to pan out? And that is an element of psychology, and it is an element of how people respond to narratives. So maybe nobody's booking, layer zero thinkers are not booking holidays during an Omicron wave, but layer one and layer two thinkers are actually saying, this is the best time to buy because nobody else is buying my holiday trip. Mm. Well, I just heard recently that the best day to buy plane tickets is Saturday and Sunday, because that's when everyone thinks that everyone else will be buying plane tickets. It used to be Tuesday. It used to be Tuesday. In my grades, right. Yeah. Um, Richard, it's been so much fun chatting with you, and thank you so much for all your insights. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Jamie. Thanks.